So let me introduce to you now Lieutenant Jeffrey Lehman. Uh, Lieutenant Lehman runs our Special Operations Division, and underneath that is Animal Control. So he is the person, the master, uh, the master, I would say, mind of putting together our animal control plan, which includes dealing with urban coyotes. So Jeffrey, please come up. Thank you, sir. Um, when I got into law enforcement, I never thought I would be standing here in front of a group of people talking about coyotes, but here I am. And I honestly never thought coyotes would be in a city like El Segundo. I live in Torrance, and all of a sudden there were coyote problems there, and I was sitting back thinking, wow, I bet you Torrance PD never saw that coming. And a year later, here I am. So it happens quick. The last six months to a year, I've learned a lot. I've learned that the reason that coyotes are here is it's our fault, our community's fault, all of our fault, because we've created a habitat for them where they can thrive. If we didn't, they wouldn't be here. And that's what Department of Fish and Wildlife is going to talk about. They're going to talk about how this habitat, how this happened, why they're here, and how they thrive. What we as a police department has done, have done to get out ahead of this is we've created, uh, we need to get into education first. That's what we want to do because we, we want to create a situation where they're here because we've created an environment where it works for them. So we'd like to educate the community where we can take that away from them and they'll go somewhere else. We don't want them here but we don't want to be the ones to get them out of. We'd like them just to go away and do it the natural way. We created a Bluetooth video, which is on El Segundo TV and on our Facebook page. We created pamphlets that our officers hand out, our animal control officer hands out. We've done a lot of Facebook posts. We've had a couple of uh, people's dogs that were attacked while they were walking them on a leash. So we do Facebook posts right after that to talk about some things that you can do if you see a coyote, whether it's stalking you or whether it's uh, actually attacking your dog. We've done Nixle alerts. We are, we've created a wildlife plan. It's about a 21 page document, which it's, it's in the works right now. But um, most of the cities that have coyote problems have these. The ultimate goal, once we finish this document, it gets approved, it gets posted on the El Segundo website so anybody can take a look at it and see what our plan is. And the number one help has been the Department of Fish and Wildlife that pick up the phone every time you call them and they come down every time I need them. This is the second time they've come down here and helped us. And so today they're going to talk to us about Wildlife Watch, which is a community education plan. And these guys are the experts here on coyotes. So any questions that you have, please ask them. These are the guys. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Lieutenant Ken Smurl and, conser and conservation coach Dave Dodge. This guy here is a volunteer. So, Lieutenant. Thank you, everybody. This is the week to give thanks. And I'm going to give some thanks here. Number one, you're here. Number two, the city of El Segundo has responded in a wonderful manner through leadership, through the chief, Lieutenant Lehman, the lead. And that's what it's going to take in, in situations like this where we're going to be talking about tonight. You're going to hear a little bit about what we call Wildlife Watch. And it's a program that is very similar to a neighborhood watch program. But what it deals with, it starts with the agencies. There's two areas. If my voice is a little, um, I'm just getting over a cold, so bear with me, okay. But what we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna talk about two areas. We're gonna talk about agency coaching, which is what I do, and so we can address this in a, a regional area, because we've been in a number of cities, all right? The El Segundo team is now part of over City, Torrance, Rolling Hills, Irvine, Fountain Valley, and the list goes on. Of cities that are proactively now engaged with working with their communities to learn about urban wildlife. In this case, it's Canis Latrance, or our coyote, which has been around for, as Dave will tell you, a long, long time. But what we're gonna talk about tonight is Wildlife Watch. So we got a little PowerPoint that we're going to do. We're going to talk about, well, what is it? What is Wildlife Watch? Basically, it is a leadership program, but it deals with partnerships at the agency level where the state works with cities, counties, private organizations to come together as a team. And we utilize a concept called conservation coaching. Conservation coaching is a process that teaches people 
and guides them through a leadership process in learning about ecological principles. As basic as they may be in, in an environment such as the city, sometimes we take them for granted and we become complacent. Food, attractants, habitat that Lieutenant Lehman talked about, space, we all have that here. But the coyote has moved in and has taken advantage of that. And since the coyote is at a different level where we are in terms of reasoning, we're humans, all right? We have the ability to reason. The coyote really doesn't. They're instinctual. God made them to be able to survive in areas where they're going to get food. And when a pet is available to them, dog food, whatever it may be, trash, they're going to take advantage of that. And as we become distracted and complacent in, the, in our day-to-day -day life, the coyotes have taken advantage of this, and they've become what we call habituated. And Dave will talk a little bit more about that. But basically, Wildlife Watch is a theoretical model that can be used and constructed differently in different cities. It's, some cities utilize a neighborhood watch program to Im implement it. Others use CERT teams, okay, which is a community um, emergency response teams. There's different ways. And so at the level to where we've had the most success, where do you think that is? It's when the community becomes involved because they realize that they are providing a safe mechanism within their community to protect their kids, to protect their pets. Pets are family. You lose, I see nod heads shaking. Yeah, it's okay, you can shake your, they're family. You lose a pet. And that's emotional. I know if a coyote took my pet, they'd be walking on a fight inside of me. The thing of it is, is that how can we be proactive, prevent that? Because then it goes to another level where they bought a kid or, or an adult. And when that happens, then what do you do? Then we have to come in, and what we do as an agency, treat it as an incident command site, collect evidence, and have to go after the offending animal. The goal here is not to gang, gang up on coyotes. People say, ah, you just want to go out and kill. The last thing we want to do, folks. But the city of El Segundo has done a great job. They've responded to the, the conservation coaching that we've tried to do with them and speaking to them, and they've taken it to another level with the development of an urban wildlife conflict policy and education for the citizens. We talked a little bit about the two levels, the agency coaching, that's what I do. We've probably spoke to 50, 50 cities now in the last two or three years. We've got a program coming up in February where all of Orange County <clears throat> will have a one-day seminar on not just Wildlife Watch, but they're going to understand ecological principles on coyotes and urban wildlife. We've partnered with the University Extension, LA Agricultural Commission, and now you guys are part of that team. They'll be, officers will be getting information so they know what to do when this happens and know that they're not alone on this. The state of California is committed to education at the agency and community level, and I mean we're committed. How do we do that with maybe six officers in a squad for all of Los Angeles County? Well, it's not easy. But it takes servant leadership principles like the natural resource volunteers that you have here, and I met another volunteer sitting over there in your city, servant leader who comes in, wants to make a difference. Unconditional giving of time and talent towards a specific mission and vision. That's what servant leadership is. And in terms of Wildlife Watch, that's how it's applied in the conservation coaching venue. Could be an invasive species, could be many areas. But one of the things we want you to come out of this meeting tonight is that it's not okay to feed wildlife. When you do that, you're disrespecting the animal. Why do people feel feed wildlife? Culturally, we've changed. We've changed anthropomorphically, putting human traits on animals. Is that a bad thing? Really? It's important to understand it. I've probably paid more tickets going down watching these types of movies. I love talking animals. The reality is, where do you have to... Where does it come reality? People are lonely today. And they feel that loneliness by doing things for other people and by feeding wildlife. And that's something that even though on the surface it may look good, 
You're creating a public nuisance, and you're, the wildlife loses fear, and the next step is somebody could get bit. And nobody wants to have to go through a rabies series, especially a little child, two to three years old. It's very, very traumatic for the family. Poaching at two levels, agencies, community. There's your community coach. I'm your agency coach, right? So that's what I do. The different levels, why is it important? Because networking is so important at the city level because each division within a city has a role to play, whether it's public works, whether it's the legal team, if there is a bite, lawsuits are involved. Understanding the laws. What are the, what are the laws? What can cities do? Parks and recreation. Open spaces, creating habitat. Working together to remove food. Remove the water in the cases where it needs to be removed. We're in a drought right now, so there's going to be water out there. But these are the things when you as a citizen understand the true basic conservation principles of coyotes, you're going to be able to what? Not just take this information for yourself and go home and sit on it. No. We're teaching you to be a coach. You're going to be able to pass that information on to your neighbors and people within your family so they understand. That's where it's at. That's how it spreads. That's how it has impact. Individual motivation, passionately advancing conservation teaching. That's the movement we're trying to spread in California. As Wildlife Watch spreads throughout Southern California and it becomes a movement because it's making change. It's teaching people how to respect animals. And when I say respect animals, <clears throat> in order to respect animals, you have to respect who first? Your neighbor. People don't realize that. But before you can respect animals, you have to learn how to respect people. Because people reason and have to understand wildlife. What does respect stand for? Its relationships are establishing shared principles, conservation principles, which empower conservation truths. That's what respect is. And when we learn that as a society and a culture, you're going to be able to pass it on to your children, and it's going to make all the difference in the world for the future. Within the Fish and Game Code, it gives the authority for cities, counties, and jurisdictional agencies to remove wildlife that they deem public safety threat. Part of the coaching aspect of it, that's as a last resort. But when animals become habituated, and they do bite humans, they need to be removed, unfortunately. Why? Because they'll bite again. Now, what happens when they bite again, and how do we know that? Forensically, we will, we will collect evidence off the person or what was bit. Could be their clothes, could be saliva from the animal, could be hair, whatever. And we match that to an animal that's taken in a trap or possibly taken by firearm. Do you realize how hard that is? How difficult that is to do? Very difficult, let me tell you. Because we don't want to have to go out there and just start shooting coyotes. And that's where we use you through Wildlife Watch. You know what that coyote looks like. It's got a white tail on its left leg and rear leg. Or it has a limp. The more we communicate with your animal control, the more you communicate with your animal control and your, your law enforcement, once that plan is established, the better it is. Communications are so key that if you don't have it in Wildlife Watch, it won't work. So the plan is, is devised so the chief has communications with all of his staff within the police department, of which animal control is part of. Joe's one of your officers. He's here today. All right. Off in the corner. He's probably going to be the first responder or one of your police officers if you do have a bite. 
What are they going to do with that information? How is that scene going to be protected? What's the next step? Wildlife Watch is designed to be able to work together in partnerships with other agencies so it's not totally new to the police officers. And you guys are brought into it, and you're going to know what to do as well. Starts by an agency meeting, which we've already had. They've responded. They've been working on, um, Lieutenant Lehman's working, like he told you, on an urban wildlife conflict plan. And these are the different areas that are part of that. Now, I'm going to move quickly through this because I got ahead of myself in the slides, and I want you to hear the best speaker because we saved the best for last. Convene the meeting. This is the kind of stuff that we look at. Sanitation's involved. Each city is a little bit different. But again, what as, as community coaches, which you all are when you leave here, you're going to think in terms of food, water, shelter, space. That's what you're going to think of. And you're going to keep it simple. And you're going to be identifying those people in the community and be nice to them. Don't be up, you know, you see somebody feeding the animals, don't go up and yell at them and just say, hey, do you realize what you're doing? And they're going to say, yeah, I'm feeding the wildlife, and I like it. And if they say it's none of your business, you back off. But you let your animal control officer know. You let us know. So somebody can go make contact with them and let them know that they're not doing the right thing. All right? They're creating a public nuisance is what they're doing, and that's what we have a real concern about because we don't get All right. I think I've talked enough on this here. I'm going to turn it over to Dave. I could go through all the different city manager, your mayor. And by the way, guess who it got started by? Your mayor. And she doesn't like that one I, when I put, but you know what? That's leadership. Everything rises and falls in leadership anything that we do in life. And what's leadership defined by? What's one word? I'll give you one word. It's called influence. And it can happen at the community level. And when it catches on, like Dave's going to talk to you about some of the success stories in some of the other cities, you're going to see how differences can be made. And El Segundo's on its way to have some major changes, which are all good. Dave, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? I hate using these microphones. And, and normally people don't have a problem hearing me, but I'll use it tonight because I think this is being recorded and it's important. So I'll do that. Um, the key between Kent and I, Kent's my boss, best boss I ever had. I got to tell you, folks, he works with the cities, the mayor's office, city council, the police department, animal services, parks and rec. He mentioned all the departments. He spends his time there working with them, coyotes off the street. We believe as the state of California, coyotes belong in the open spaces, out in the oil fields, but not on the street, okay? That's the key. Now what's happened? I'll tell you the biggest problem I face as being a volunteer for California Department of Fish and Wildlife is people feeding wildlife. That's why we've got the problem is either directly or indirectly. And I mean, I've seen people throwing sandwiches to them on trails, hiking trails. You know, when a coyote, first of all, when a coyote's born, just quickly, when a coyote's born, a coyote is deathly afraid of us. Deathly afraid of us. Absolutely wants nothing to do with us. But over time, mama takes that young coyote out in the, out in the world, and starts showing that coyote how to survive in the city. And by the way, these are city coyotes. That's an urban coyote. Anybody got any idea what the weight is? Anybody? Good guess. 17 to 24 pounds is the average coyote in the city. Now, some get up to 35, maybe 40. But you guys, nothing like 80, 90 pounds, <laughs> you know, that some people have reported. Back to my point is that when a coyote starts off deathly afraid of us, over time, as mom takes it out into the world and shows it how to survive, the coyote starts seeing humans. What do we normally do when we see a coyote? We either avoid it or ignore it. I mean, usually that's what happens. 
Most people don't haze coyotes. One thing we'll talk about before this meeting's over is hazing. Um, but most people don't. We ignore them. Just, there goes a coyote, or walk past it and keep going. Well, guess what happens? All of a sudden, the coyote says, hmm, there's a human, but no threat to me. Doesn't bother me. And let me tell you, these animals are extremely intelligent and very athletic. They'll jump a six-foot fence in a New York minute. So we've got a coyote now. It's come out, out of the den, almost teaching it how to survive. It sees humans. It's not afraid. All of a sudden now, the coyote begins to being fed by humans, either directly or indirectly. Now we've got a problem. Now we've got an animal that's relying on us as a source of food. We'll either take it to food or we'll provide it to them. You know, people feed pets all the time and water pets outside. I tell them, please don't do that. What happens? The excess food that's left there in water, the rodents come in and get it. Guess who eats the rodents? The coyotes. And, oh, by the way, if the rodents didn't happen to get that excess food and water, the coyote will get it. Let me tell you something. One thing we've learned over the years, coyote will not go any more than a half a mile from its last meal. Kent talked about pets. Oh, God, I talk to the public every week, and I talk to some of the nicest people in the world that have lost pets. And, I mean, it's just like losing a kid. It's unbelievable. Now, I want to tell you something, and please just hear me through. From the standpoint of the coyote, that's natural behavior taking that pet. That pet's in the food chain when it's in the backyard unattended. That pet's in the food chain when we're taking cell phone and we're walking down the road with our animal at night. We're putting that pet in the food chain. And when you live in a coyote area, a wildlife area, you can't. You just can't. You've got to be smart. You've got to protect pets just like you do your kids, okay? And I'm telling you folks, believe you me, if that animal is unattended, you're putting it in the food chain, okay? It's not a matter of will the coyote get that pet, it's a matter of when the coyote will. Okay, that's our experience. So please, if nothing else, take that out, share it with your neighbors in the neighborhood, um, that that's a real problem. But that's the biggest issue I have, is people feeding wild. Um, a month ago, I was up in Baldy. We had campers in campgrounds in Baldy feeding bears. These bears are 350 pounds. You know why they were feeding them? To get the bears to come in close. You could take pictures with the bear or show the kids a bear up close and personal that's not in a cage. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, but that's what we're dealing with. That's what we've created. So, enough said about that. Just to understand the coyote. Is, is an animal, when it crosses the line, and it is absolutely a last resort, professionals, your animal controls um, expert, and our local officer, our local game warden in the area will make the decision if that coyote's crossed the line, okay? And if it's crossed the line, forgive me, it has to be removed. Now, yes, ma'am. You know, you guys, we get calls of coyotes the coyotes are moving. You know, we were always taught they're nocturnal. That's baloney. They are not nocturnal. Not true. They love to move under the cover of darkness. They, they do most of their heavy traveling at night because they're not seen. You know what I mean? We get call hours of coyotes moving through the neighborhood. You know what I mean? Looking for an easy opportunity, an easy pet to take. Why go chase a jackrabbit in the field when you can take an animal in the backyard that's unattended? Okay? especially if that animal is under 20 pounds, ideally 10 pounds, that's what they like. They are intimidated by our size, and they don't normally attack humans, okay? Now, let me, let me take that one step further. Kent and I have done a lot of research on these attacks. Last summer, not this summer that just went by, but the summer of 2015 in the city of Irvine, one of the stories, success stories, I want to talk to you about, Wildlife Watch and connect it to the success story. I think you guys will really be impressed. Um, we had six bites in 90 days. Disastrous. 
three of those six bites were on kids under three years old. Under three years old. So there were three adults and three kids bit in 90 days. We didn't see it coming, you guys. Animal services didn't see it coming. It just hit us like a ton of bricks. Almost all summer in the city of Irvine. Okay, working with animal services and trying to find the offending pet. You know what we found out all this? Quick story. We found a woman that was feeding wildlife and putting bowls of food out for the coyotes all over town. Mama had just had four pups in the spring, took them out, out of surviving the world. She took them to those bowls of food. Here's young coyotes now that are habituated to the point where they're looking to us to provide food, okay? We went in, there was a bite on a little girl, first bite, little girl, three years old, in a park. We went in, we trapped, trapped a coyote, we trapped mama. So you guys see how the plot thickened. Now we've got four coyotes, young coyote, no mama, who does all the training, and she's gone. And you've got four stupid coyotes that are out there running around. Guess what you got? They're biting people all over town. What we learned out of that was, thank goodness, we got three of the four coyotes, offending coyotes. One of those coyotes had bit not once, but twice. Talked about, we've learned so much in the last couple of years with what's happened. And now they're starting to become science. We're starting to get some science-based facts on the coyotes. So much of it's been just, you know, gut feeling and, and hearsay. People ask me all the time, does hazing work? big and you jump around and you scream and yell at the top of your lungs to scare that coyote, to change that coyote's behavior. People ask me all the time, does it work? Yes, it works. I know it works because I've hazed coyotes on a number of occasions. I mean, I've chased them down the street. But is there any science on it? Not yet. Isn't that interesting? That's just, that's just years of doing this, okay? No science on it. There will be. We're partnered uh, with the extension program. And Dr. Neve Quinn is doing a lot of science right now and collecting a lot of information on it. So we'll have much, much more for you to offer you. Put my pitch up there. I want to show you, I've got eight quick slides that I want to take you through. A 30,000 foot look at this program called Wildlife Watch. But the difference is, I'm going to talk to you about it, meaning with you guys, because we need your help. I mean, the bottom line is, we cannot fix the coyote problem. There's not enough game wardens, there's not enough animal service people, and there sure aren't enough policemen to take care of all the wildlife issues in every city and unincorporated area in Southern California. There's just not enough of us. If you don't help us, it's not going to happen. Okay? That's why we're tickled And you're with us tonight. Let's go. Wildlife Watch at the it is a leadership program, as Ken said, and it really is. Let me ask you something. This program, and it makes sense, and I've got some documented results that actually show this program works, and it's worth our time and effort. Would you guys be interested in getting involved in something like that? If it got the coyotes off the street? Give me a show of hands. Raise your hand if you'd be interested in working on that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm just interested, you guys, because I'm going to show you a program now at 30,000 feet, and I'm going to give you a couple of quick testimonials and then turn it loose for questions and answers. What I'm in hopes of, for those of you that raised your hand, all I need is one block cap, maybe one volunteer on the same street. We'll put this program, and I'll show you how it works. I'll take you through it and show you how to make this thing work. Guess what? It expands like wildfire because your neighbors on the other street say, hey, what's going on? How come there's no coyotes in your neighborhood, but I got them all over here? It works, you guys. And Irvine is the testimonial. Because when I tell you the Irvine story, eight slides real quick. And I'm going to tell you about Irvine. And I'm going to tell you about uh, Culver City. Okay, two communities I worked with real close. Went at it a couple of different ways. That's the beauty of this program. One, it's proactive, meaning we're not waiting for the coyotes to bite us. We're going to take action, and we're, we're going to take action. You and I are. Two, besides being 
What is it? The leadership program, me, you working together, the police department with animal services, and the city folks here in the mayor's office. Get rid of these animals off the street. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to harness the community. That's the whole idea is we want to just start small and then grow this thing over time, get the public behind this. Once we do, in Irvine, I started with one street, one block captain, one volunteer. And this thing's just grown like you can't believe. The community has blessed it, and we talk about some of the things they did. Knock your socks off. It's getting people to work together to get coyotes off the street. What we do is, is I'm going to help you. I'm going to teach you all about the difference between a sighting, an encounter, an imminent threat. I mean, that coyote is a real possible threat. And then also, we don't talk about that. We talk about natural versus unnatural behavior. I'm going to train you on that, okay? And share with ideas, concepts, on the difference between natural, natural and unnatural behavior. Let me give you an example just quickly. Saturday morning, 7.30, you've got a cup of coffee in your hand. You go to the front door. You're going to go down at the end of the driveway and get your newspaper, right? You open the front door. There's coyotes sitting down there at the end of the driveway. Coyote sees you, you see the coyote, boom. Is that natural or unnatural behavior? That's natural. A coyote's still afraid of you. He's not habituated to the point where he's crossed the line and he's a threat. Okay? Same scenario. 7 30 morning, cup of coffee in your hand, you go to the front door, you look down at the end of the driveway, there's a coyote. Coyote looks at you, you look at the coyote, the coyote doesn't move. So you go in the house. And you get your wife's best set of pots and pans and a banger, and you go out and you just start beating that thing as fast as you can. Coyote doesn't move. So you go back in the house and you pick up some tennis balls or golf balls or something. You go outside and you throw them at the coyote, near the coyote, not at the coyote. Coyote doesn't move. Is that natural or unnatural behavior on the part of the coyote? Unnatural is right. Unnatural is right. That coyote could be a problem down the road. Okay, I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying it could be. That coyote has habituated to the point where it's no longer afraid of humans. Okay? That's when a coyote becomes a possible problem. Okay? That's when we need the expert. Local animal services folks and our local game warden working together. Okay. Next slide, Ken. What's my role? My role is, as a conservation coach, you guys, is to share everything I know about coyotes. By the way, we're talking about coyotes. The program works for bears, mountain lions, squirrels, possums, skunks. I mean, whatever you got a problem with. These principles are solid. The cornerstone built this program using Neighborhood Watch that was so successful in the 70s, really helped the police force deal with crime in these great big urban cities and everything else, using those principles, some cornerstones from conservation coaching, he put this program together. It's a pilot. It is. We're still working with our management, our senior management in the state to get it approved and blessed once and for all. But we've had so much success. So many communities are so interested in it now. It's flying. I mean, we <laughs> can't wait anymore is the bottom line. Kent deals at the agency level. level. I walk the streets, tracking in your neighborhood, with you. We walk the streets. You know what we're looking for? We're looking for brushy areas and bush where the coyotes can hide under, and either watch, watch the neighborhood, watch the street, or ambush from, ambush pets from. In Irvine, I was so fortunate. My wildlife watch team in Irvine went to the city landscaping department. Had them come out, and at the end of this magnificent cul-de-sac with this wonderful walking path trail, they cut those plants and those bushes up and back so the coyotes couldn't lay on her anymore. And watch the neighborhood. Watch the dog. Watch the cats. Watch the kids. Couldn't do that anymore. They even removed plants. That's why that's so important. So we walk the neighborhood. We're looking for attractants. We even inventory backyards. For those people that are interested and want us to do that, we'll go with you guys. We'll knock on a neighbor's door and we'll say, hey, what's your backyard? 
inventory, we'll be glad to do that. Why do we want to do that? Let me tell you what I found in Irvine. I found barbecue grills. Hadn't been cleaned in months. Can you guys imagine the scent that comes off a barbecue grill that a coyote can smell? We found bird feed. Now, you wouldn't think bird feed is an issue. But what happens? Bird lands on the bird feeder. The bird seed, bird seed, extra bird seed falls on the ground. The rodents come in and eat the bird seed. Guess who eats the rodents? another source of food, isn't it? Keeping a coyote in the area. And I'm telling you folks, if we don't take the food source away and water, we're not going to get rid of them. End the message. Okay? We've just had a nice time together, but that's the truth. It's all said and done. So, we're going to walk the neighborhood, we'll identify attractants, we'll inventory. We set up wildlife watch teams, and I've got them going. In Culver City, I've got 14 teams run by Neighborhood Watch captains that took on the responsibility of wildlife as well as their criminal stuff, okay? And uh, I've got 314 houses covered by 14 block captains and their volunteers in their neighborhood that are knocking on doors, talking to the residents about feeding, removing food and water, don't feed anything outside, removing the attractants, cleaning the barbecue grills, taking the bird feeders down, just being smart and walking their pets smart, and not leaving pets in the backyard unattended. Okay, so we assist and set up these teams and we educate everybody. Most important, when to report. One of the biggest problems going right now, report. In the city of Irvine, in this area that I'm talking about that I put my wildlife watch program in, you guys know you can call the city. For some reason, they had a problem with calling animal services or the police department in the city to report what they were seeing. Well, the city can't fix what they don't know about. Okay, I mean, it's just that simple. So the bottom line was, we had a reporting problem. We work with you to teach you how to report. Who to report, what to report, and when to report. Okay, that's just a part of the program. Why is it needed? I mentioned it, guys, and we're not going to grind this slide. Bottom line is, there isn't enough of it. You guys don't help us and, and, and the heavy lifting with us, we're not going to get this thing fixed. That's simple. Next slide. Who do we work with? You guys, I work with mobile home parks. I work with kinds of neighborhoods, residents, apartment building and dwellings, homeowner associations. You know how I got started in Irvine? The homeowner association. We held a community meeting like this. Came. In fact, we had a packed house. We had them standing out in the foyer out there listening. What was going on? As a result of that meeting, at the end of that meeting, asked, is there a block captain? Is there somebody in here that'll step up and say, I'll organize my street and get started? And a woman did. She says, I'll do it, and I'll get a volunteer. So that tent from that, we, we set up the community meeting, as I mentioned, as we talk about it. We set up a leadership team meeting. That leadership team, Animal Services, self, HOA, the Homeowner Association president, and this woman who became the block for Jasper Native Trails Wildlife Watch in Irvine, Portello Springs, Irvine. Okay? We do that, we get that set up. Share information, contact information, get that block captain to pull. Away we go. Now we've got some place to start. Somebody that says, I'm going to take my street back, and I'm going to help my neighbors on my street get it back. Okay, what would happen next? After we have the community meeting, identify a block captain and a volunteer, hopefully a volunteer, ultimately we want to get every community in the area that will get involved, that will be a part of it. Everybody's going to participate. I mean, we just know that. It, just, it doesn't happen. But if we can get the majority of to participate, if we can get them to do that, that's all we need. That's all we need. Right? So what we'll do is we'll have a meeting, our first meeting with this group. 
we'll outline some jobs, some things that need to be done, and we'll assign jobs to different people. And we'll put some timelines on it, some expectations, explain the job, go through the responsibilities, and, and these people step up, and these volunteers with the block captain step up and take responsibility. As an example, one of the jobs is having somebody on the wild in this neighborhood responsible for tracking and reporting sighting. Really important. I mean, every time you see a coyote, call animal services, please. And tell them, even if it's just a sighting, you understand they're not going to come out. Now it's long gone. By the time they get there or we get there, too late. But at least we know. And who better knows what doing in a neighborhood than you guys? I mean, every time I walk a street and talk to the neighborhood, you know what I find out? They can tell you which way the in, which way they're leaving, how many there were, what they looked like, what were they doing. It's amazing. You guys know about your neighborhood and you know what's going on. Best source of information in town. So what we do is create this job tracking and reporting, which is really critical. Also, create a, a job, somebody that worked with me real close to head up, walk in the neighborhood, getting as many interested and involved as we can, but offering to inventory backyards, again, looking for attractive. One of the evening, I did a walk in Irvine. You know what I did? I went especially the night that took the trash out. Interesting. You know, coyotes are scavengers. You understand they eat trash, too. They'll eat anything. I mean, these, these critters, depending upon how hungry they are, will eat insects. Now, they've got to be real desperate and real hungry, but they will do that. I went out and walked Irvine with I've watched team members. We just watched the trash cans come out in the evening after dinner. Amazing. I mean, some of those trash cans you couldn't even clean. They were so full of trash. And if you walked up to those trash cans and took a whiff, it'd knock your socks off, some of the stuff that was in those trash cans. Do you think that's an attractant? Do you think that might be coyotes in the area? Bet you everything I own, and then some. Absolutely. So you know what we did? We started a program. That night we started a program, and then we publicized it in a little one-page flyer that we put out to the neighborhood, to all the residents in the neighborhood. Call share a trash can. And the program works like this. If your trash can, on the night it's scheduled to go out for pickup, first of all, we recommend don't take it out the night before, take it out the day of. Take it out the night before. We understand that. Then do us a favor. Make sure that doggone trash can lid will close and it can't be opened by rodents or coyotes. And how you do that is if you got extra trash, knock on your neighbor's door and say, hey, would you mind if I put my extra bag of trash on your can just so my little clothes and your little clothes and we're both happy? Worked like a champ. Worked like a champ. What do we do, you guys? Simple thing like that. We moved one source of food. You know, with Wildlife Watch, I mentioned about getting a brush and bush to manage. But looking for, for bird feeders and, and just things that attract these animals and keep them in the area. If you do just one thing, just get rid of the food or get rid of the water or get rid of the attract all the attractants or manage the habitat or manage the trash, you're ahead of the game. You're ahead of the game. You're in right now, okay? If you do just one thing. So, next slide. By the way, we do hold a monthly meeting. I hold monthly meetings with the Wildlife Watch team. You know what we talk about? What was the coyote activity last month? What are we going to do this month? How are we going to keep the neighborhood aware and interested? You know what the biggest problem I have in Earth? Complacency. Guys, in Irvine, this could be in Irvine. I told you they had kids under 90 days. One of those bites took place in this community. And there were sightings. People were quacking about it all the time, about seeing coyotes at the end of the street under the brush. They were laying in there all hours of the day, just watching, looking. So 
We put our wildlife watch program in, walked the streets on a number of occasions, talking to the homeowners. We had a picnic in a park, kids, lunch, a chair, a sack lunch, and a drink. And we talked about hazing. And we talked about what kids do if they should hire a coyote in the area. What do kids do? A couple of things. Number one, this is digressing, but this is important. Number one, we don't want kids hazing coyotes. Number one. Number two, we never want a kid to run. Never, and please take that home to your family and grandkids or whatever. We never want a child to run from a coyote. It triggers that predator-prey relationship. One of the things we learned on those three little kids under three years old in Irvine that were bit, you know what we learned? Coyotes, we're not on the menu as adults for coyotes. And if a coyote bites an adult, you know what it's doing? It's nipping the, the adult to say, feed me, because it's been fed somewhere along the line. Somebody's actually fed that coyote. So when it bites you, it, it's, it's not. A coyote, when it kills, it crushes its prey's skull juggler, and breaks its neck. I mean, and just ravishes it. I mean, that's how they kill. But these adults that are bit, it's getting nipped. They're getting nipped on the back of the leg or the heel or whatever. They're trying to get your attention. They want food. Somebody somewhere has fed them. Somewhere along the line. And that's a bad guy. Irvine, we put our program in place, you guys. For 12 months, they did not report a coyote sighting in the area. For 12 months after there had been a bit and a number of coyote reports, not reported to the city agencies, but just within us when we walked and talked to the community, how it's laying at the end of that cul-de-sac, under that brush and bush. You guys, they hadn't seen one in 12 months. In the 13th month, they had their first coyote sighting. Not an encounter, not an imminent threat, not an attack. It was a sighting. You know what it was? Running down the street, never stopped. Never stopped. Just started at this end of the street, ran all the way to... Never stopped. You know why, you guys? Because we took the attractive. We took everything they want and need out of that community, for the most part. We covered sauna. It was a sauna lid, and it was available. The sauna wasn't being used. Uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. Hot tub. Cover it if you're not using it. If you've got a pool cover and your pool's not being used, cover it. Because it is a source of water. It's little things like that. Make the whole 13th month, they had their first coyote sighting. Passing through. This is the first. We haven't had a sighting this month. So in 14 months, they've had one coyote sighting. Not a threat. Not a big issue. That's what happens when the community gets involved and when you take away a Keys to success. Leadership. Leadership, 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 leadership. All I need is one person. Raise your hand and say, I'll get, I'll get my block organized. I'll take responsibility and get that done. Number two, strong community involvement. Like I say, we don't get everybody. We know that. There's a lot of people that just can't get involved or won't get Hey, we get everybody else. We create a communication. That is so critical, guys. Communications both within the Wildlife Watch team in the wildlife watch team, out to all the residents in the area. Fact. Really important communications. I, I can't tell you how much that means, because again, reporting is everything. City can't fix what they don't know about. And they got limited resources, and so do we. So we got where we do work together, and we're here for you. I mean, the bottom line is the state's here for you. It's here for the city of El Segundo. It's here for your mayor, your city council, and for sure your police department that's been so good to us. We're here for you. We create reporting and tracking systems. You guys, I track coyote activity. I mean, besides everything else I do, <laughs> I try to do that. You know, Hey, is the program working? Because guess what? If we were seeing 10 sightings a month in a given area, 
And now all of a sudden, after removing the attractants and doing some work and knocking on doors and talking to all the neighbors, making them aware of the coyote situation, it drops to four, the program's working. Would you say? Absolutely. One indicator for me to know where my programs are. If I see that spike from 10 to 15, guess what? I'm out there in a New York minute saying, what's going on? Why are there more coyote sightings? What's happening? Back out on the streets, knocking on doors again. I mean, this thing doesn't end until you guys say it's over. I mean, that's the bottom line. Wildlife Watch is an ongoing program forever, you guys, until you say, done. You don't have a coyote problem. Okay? What do you think? Oh, one last thing, hazing technique. See the last bullet up there on that PowerPoint? In Irvine, what I did was, I had, it, this is an older neighborhood, Irvine. I had some folks that just weren't capable of hazing coyotes. Hazing is a process of trying to scare the coyote and make them afraid of us again. Okay? I'll be honest with you. Coyote, when it becomes habituated, can get to the point where hazing doesn't work. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes it doesn't work. But most times it does, and it's absolutely worth doing. But the problem was the neighborhood I was working with, a lot of people couldn't hate. You know what we got? We got a couple of young guys who lived in the neighborhood. And we trained them on how to hate. Basic hazing techniques and advanced hazing techniques. And what happens is, by the way, as an interesting side note, we got on next door, and we carved out a little s special section in next door just for my wildlife watch team and the neighborhood that they serve. And we got as many people's email addresses as we could possibly get that wanted to be involved in that. So that if there's a sighting, immediately an alert, an alert goes out, put in a message into next door, we get an alarm out, and it rings everybody's cell phone. So they know what's going on. That's one way we communicate. We train the guys to hate, that know how to hate. And that if we got an alarm saying, hey, there's a coyote on the street, and you guys are home, one or two, we would go out and look for the animal. Start looking for the animal. Okay? They're looking for them. We keep them out of the neighborhood. And if they see one, now, the good news is they haven't had a lot of activity in Irvine and Portello Springs, but they're trained. They know how to do it, and they were certified by Animal Services and us. We blessed them. They know how to haze, okay? Hazing is for another meeting, another time. I'd be glad to share that with you because it's an important process, and it's used, again, to change that coyote's behavior. Kids, we don't want them to run. We want them to maintain eye contact with that animal. Don't turn your back ways. Maintain eye contact. Back up slowly, very slowly, and get to safety. It's really important for kids. Never. The last death we had in the state of California was 1981. A little girl named Kelly Keene in Glendale. Okay, she was three years old. She's out in the front yard. She's playing in the front yard. Coyote comes into the front yard. By the way, there was a neighbor that was feeding coyote directly. Kelly Keene was in the front yard. She ran from the coyote, triggered that predator-prey relationship, and the coyote killed her immediately. Okay? That's the last death, 1981. We don't want anything like that ever again. And it's our responsibility, all of ours, mine, yours, everybody.